Hey there everybody, it's Nathan Cool with NathanCoolPhoto.com and in this video I want to give you my review of the new AD400 Pro by Godox. Now since a review I did a couple videos back reviewing the AD200 Pro, I've gotten a lot of feedback, a lot of questions from you regarding, well, how about this light, how about that light? And some of you have gone out and bought the AD400 Pro, had some good results with it, wanted to see my take with it, so I thought, well, let me go ahead and give this a shot. I was able to get my hands on one and what I'm going to do is I'm going to compare it to then my favorite uh, Explore 600 and then also the 8200 which is extremely popular. So since this is very new what does it really buy us for benefits? So first thing I did was I started taking it around the house here. We just had some renovations done so I thought this would be a good opportunity to test this out. I didn't take it into the field yet and I'm going to get to reasons why actually I'm just not quite ready to use this for real estate photography but I still love this light and a lot of different ways. So I'm going to get to that closer to the end of the video and show you some of my path forward with probably using then the 8400 Pro once I overcome a few of the obstacles and hopefully a few things that can change with this. Anyways, let's take a closer look at where it really counts since this is a 400 watt second mono light, this is a 600 and of course we've got the 200. How does this really match up for power when it comes down to it? So when we take a look doing the same tests I've done before using a light meter at ISO 320, one one hundredth of a second, when we go to an eighth power on the Explore 600, we're at almost f5.6 at uh, 4 plus 0 0.9. 8400 Pro is about a uh, half stop less than that, which is very impressive since it's only about 200 watt seconds less, so 4.0.5. And then of course the 8200 Pro, per the last tests, came out exactly the same at about one stop difference from the Explore 600. When we get up to a quarter power, the Explore 600 is well above a halfway toward uh, getting at F8 at F5.6 plus 0 0.6. The uh, 8400 Pro was just slightly under that, so it really was very impressive when we got to a quarter power. Uh, the 8200 Pro, once again, about a stop difference from the Explore 600 half power. That's when we start to see some noticeable differences and more so when we get into full power. So when we get up to the full power, we can really see that this is where the 8400 Pro is starting to struggle a little bit. Not bad though, but this is where it had the biggest difference. We're almost a half stop difference completely uh, compared to using the Explore 600. But that really falls, it's splitting hairs really compared to some of the other test results. And of course, the 8200 Pro still came in at uh, about uh, a one stop difference from the Explorer 600. Now some of that, which I'm going to show some close-ups and some pluses and minuses of the reflector that's attached here and some of the bones mount options that you have with the 8400 Pro, some of it could be argued that there's no diffuser that's on here, where there's a diffuser on the Explorer 600 when I use it. But from my testing that I've done over and over again, the Explorer 600's diffuser here has negligible difference. In fact, it isn't even detected on the light meter, even at uh, one-tenth stop increments uh, when I'm doing the measurements. So that really doesn't fall into the argument that that would uh, have any difference. This is a bit more concentrated uh, a light beam that's coming out of here because of the size of the reflector. And I'm going to show you the test results of that and one of the things that I really love about this compared to the, the, uh, the typical 7 inch reflector that comes on the uh, 8600. And of course, as I showed a couple videos back reviewing the 8200 Pro, hated the light bloom that came uh, by default out of the 8200, but it's easy enough to work around, not that big of a deal. So anyways, the biggest uh, issue besides just how much power you get out of it is, is it portable enough? So what are you really saving yourself when you go from an Explore 600 to the 8400? Or if you're used to using the 8200, are you really benefiting much? Obviously, we're getting more power, as we can see, it's going to be equal in some regards, maybe about a half stop difference compared to the Explore 600. But the price is actually something to consider here. So when we take a look at the 8400 Pro, it's coming in at $650 US. This is all US. Um, now that's because it only comes in TTL. The Explore 600, you can get in a non-TTL version, not the Pro, but just the older Explore 600, and that's only $550. That's $100 less, and you get a little bit more power out of it. The 8200 is 300, and the 8200 Pro is 350. So it's $100 more compared to the Explorer, so does it, is that really worth it for me to lose a little bit of power? Am I going to gain enough portability? 
So as you can see here, when you really put them side by side, there is some difference in size. So the 8400 Pro measures at almost about a foot. It's a 11 and a quarter inches from the top of the reflector down to the bottom of the battery when it's installed. And it's about four and a quarter inches wide. The Explorer 600 is a little bit bigger. It is 13 inches long, but if you're measuring from the top of this big honking reflector that comes standard with it. If you modified that, you could obviously reduce some of that size. But it's one of the things I do like about it in some regards when I do need to use this light, I've got that big reflector. Now, it also comes in at about four and a half inches wide compared to four and a quarter inches here. But when you get to the 8200, you can see it's a, a lot smaller light. So when we lose uh, a complete uh, stop of power between using um, this compared to maybe an 8200 Pro, then it's, that's kind of a lot to consider you know, for the portability. So it really comes down to then for the rest of the review, really want to concentrate on the differences between these two guys here. So when you take a look at the weight, obviously the 8200 Pro is going to be light. It only comes in at two and a half pounds, but the Explorer 600 is a big honking seven pounds. So that's uh, definitely a heavy light, not one you want to have on a fragile light stand. It's on an air cushion light stand actually here. And then the 8400 Pro, that comes in at uh, a five and a half pounds. So the difference between the weight of the 8400 Pro and the Explorer 600 is only a pound and a half. So I didn't find it to be that much different. So some of the portability and the weight issues also for me were a bit of a problem because this is not an ergonomic light. So not yet anyways. And this is one of the things that's holding me off until I really take it in the field because I love the handle that comes here with the Explorer 600. So as you might know if you've seen uh, me use this on other videos and also if you have one that the lights down, light stand mount is a handle. You can grab that and you can walk around a property no problem with that. But here you've just got this little bit of a handle here to grip and it's really not that much to work with. Also, I'm going to show you a close-up next, and that's where I didn't really care for. They use kind of a standard uh, wing-shaped uh, uh, loosening uh, mechanism for the handle, and that makes it difficult also on site, and they're also prone to breakage. Let's take a closer look at that. So taking a closer look here when we compare, there's definitely a big difference in ergonomics. So the Explore 600 has this handle and you know I'm a big fan of that. So as I'm walking around, I can take this off the light stand and it's a great grip. It is heavy, but you've got this great ergonomic grip to be able to hold this as you need to and move it around. But if you notice something too that's definitely different, you see it get a little shake because it's seven pounds trying to move that around. So it is a bit of a beast. But once again, it's only about a pound and a half difference when we take a look at the 8400, which has even a less ergonomic handle. If I tried to pull this off, I'm going to go ahead and just take this off of the, uh, the light stand here. There's nothing really for me to grip. I've got just this little bit of an area here. There's just not much for me. And it's also got this thing on here, this little uh, wing uh, type of uh, loosener. Now they put these on so that you can push in the button, you can loosen, you can tighten, so you can move this because it's going to be hitting the light all the time. So this is common on other lights, but it drives me bananas using it and also I've stripped these out before on the Explorer 600 so if you take a look I've got a little uh, red knurled knob here taking a closer look at that breaking it apart it's just a DIY type of thing where I used a carriage bolt if you're not familiar with that, that's just a, a bolt that has a little square thing in it so it fits into a square hole like they have here. And then a washer would go up against it. Then you got this knurled knob and I can real quickly then move that around and I can tighten it as I need to. And I'm not messing around with a big thing like that. So I'd probably go ahead and replace this with that knurled knob uh, and also possibly then work on putting a handle in here. There's a lot of different hardware I could get to mount in there. So I'm working on something like that. But the, one of the problems that I see though is that with the Explorer 600 I've stripped this out before. Now some of that was also because they used a softer metal inside of the uh, this this wing handle but um, this uh, 8400 Pro has looks like steel in both but once again though uh, even though I could use a carriage bolt on the Explore 600 for changing that out on my little DIY uh, handle mount 
I can't do that on the uh, 8400 Pro. This mount is pretty much built in. Now they do have the ability to remove this whole handle mechanism, but you'd have to replace it with that same part to make it fit. So I can't just run down to the hardware store or something like that, and like I would on the Explorer 600 or other lights, and put something like that together. Now the 8200 obviously doesn't have that. It doesn't have this either though, and it makes it much easier to hand hold. And of course it's so light. It's like holding a, a speed light. So anyways, that was one of the big things that for me, just for real estate photography, being out in the field, having this guy didn't really help me much. It worked against me, and I can't really then take this off the stand and hold. I might be able to hold it under my hand and do some stuff with it, but I didn't really feel safe doing that. So speaking of handles, one of the other annoying things that I found, it's a small knit really, a uh, lot of lights and they come with this little handle here. Now that's very popular for studio lights. You can grab this, you can carry it around. But for real estate photography, we do with so many bounce flashes, we want to turn this straight up. So if we do go ahead and turn that straight up, we can see that it just runs right into a light stand. So that really doesn't do us much good. So that does need to be removed. But once you do remove it, then it positions itself very well. In fact, it's very flush up against the uh, straight up and down because of the way that the mount is made. And that's actually a little bit better than the Explorer 600. The Explorer 600 tends to lean sometimes a little bit back because it uses a ratchet. So when we take a look at the Explorer 600, taking it off the stand and just putting it up against here real quick, when we ever, ever have to move that and change the position, it's got that ratchet kind of that annoying click, click, click. So similar to the uh, 8200, the 80, excuse me, the 8200 Pro, the 8400 Pro also has the clutch mechanism. So although I don't like the little wing adjustment that they have right now, it is a very smooth adjustment. There's no ratchet in there. It is just a clutch. And then when it comes down here, the flat portion of the light does mount very well, nice and flat up against the mount as well. Now, one of the things that I love, love, love about the uh, uh, Explore 600, and I also love this about the 8400 Pro, is that they've put the controls on the side. This is so helpful for real estate photography because as you've seen, you know, we tend to turn this straight up. The 8200 has those controls on the back and that always makes it difficult if you're walking around and having to set something. You've got uh, something on a stand, for instance, like this. You can always control it from uh, a remote trigger like the, uh, the R2 Pro or X Pro trigger by Godox, but it is so nice having a large display also on the side instead of the little small little one on the 8200 Pro which is even smaller print um, than a speed light and for an old fart like me the bigger the letters the better when we come to seeing it now there is something though highly annoying with this and I am hoping that the Godox engineers will change this on another firmware release in which they can just with firmware not hardware is that when you first power this up you have this unlock and you have to then turn your wheel to unlock it to have that display. See how big the letters are? Love that. It's great for old guys like me. But that unlock feature is very annoying because as I'm going through between ambient and flash frames, if I'm hand carrying this, I'm doing all the adjustments manually as I'm popping from room to room. So if when I'm doing hand holding stuff, which of course we know is going to be an issue with the handle so far, but when I do this, a lot of times I'll just shut the light off real quick, take my ambient shot, turn the light on to take my flash shot. Now I have to spin this wheel to unlock it. So it's this extra annoying step that no other light I've ever had had to do this. So that's just a small nit. The other thing too, and this is similar to the 8200 Pro, you might think of it as a feature. I see of it as just a small annoyance is that you have to, when you turn the thumb wheel, it does these adjustments in one tenth increments. Now, most all lights, and including the triggers right now, except for possibly a new firmware update release like on the X Pro or R2 Pro, um, are typically in 0 0.3 and 0 0.7 increments. So those are one third stop increments, and that's very quick. I don't need to adjust between a quarter plus 0.4 to a quarter plus 0.5. That buys me nothing with light. Third stop is hardly enough. Usually it's a full stop that I'm looking at. So this is just spinning the wheel way too much. It's also just when you're moving through very quickly and you're hardly looking at stuff and you go, okay, you just want to move the thumb wheel once and you know that would be a third of a stop. It's not. It's a tenth of a stop. It's a very small knit. You may like that for me with all the work that I've been used to doing over all the years. This was just something that I found unconventional and just a very small knit. 
Now looking at the reflector, this is something I, I love in a lot of ways. There's stuff that I'm not all that happy with. It is a very good reflector. It's very compact. The bulb itself has a diffuser face to it, so it's actually frosted glass. So it does a very good job. We'll take a look at the bloom of it in just a second here. But this in itself to me is just fine for real estate photography, except that moving this around so much and hand holding it, laying it down on stuff, it would be great like on the Explorer 600 if there was just a thin diffuser over this so even just something that popped on top of that I would really like to see that so um, they do have a, a cover that that covers this to protect it when you uh, do pack this away although that has a hole in the center of it and of course that's something just to be cautious of that if you pack it in a in a case with a light stands this is just something but they do have a cover that does protect it but they do advertise that they have a Bowens mount now this is recessed enough it's it's good it's going to give you a good amount of bloom probably protect the bulb fairly well the Bowens mount though isn't as simple as it sounds so uh, this is all pretty much a quick release system so I can uh, pull this back similar uh, similar on other lights like this where you have a, a type of quick release system so there we have the bulb and that's all good and that's somewhat exposed um, you know while you're working on this but you wouldn't have to worry about that even if you're using an umbrella on there using the Bowens mount though you have to put on their speed ring so you have to put this guy on there now it does fit on there on their quick release system it's got a little uh, thing here but that's replacing what would be up here so to get that on the system itself where it would fit there, you have to remove some Allen screws on the top and then mount those Allen screws here and also then on the bottom. So it's a semi-permanent placement to be able to do Bowen's mount. So it's either basically, in my opinion, it's too cumbersome to do out in the field. So this is either you're gonna go out on a shoot and use Bowen's mount stuff or you're just gonna use the standard reflector. Putting the standard reflector on is pretty simple. It is that quick release system, so you just put this guy on there, turn it, it goes into the quick release, and it's in there steady. Real nice, good, firm fit, doesn't rattle around on there, doesn't make any noise as you're moving it, and of course, then when you pack it up, you just put this uh, little compression type of cap on, and there's that hole in the center that I warned about. Now, I'm sure they do that for heat, so you can pop this on when you're done with your shoot and move out, and you'll get some ventilation. That, though, is probably about a quarter inch away from hitting that diffuser glass on the bulb, and that bulb to replace it, if you do damage it, that's $120 to replace that bulb so it's a it's a hefty cost which is it's not out of line for any lights but it is just something to be aware of and that's why if I felt if there was just a diffuser piece of material over top of this as an option uh, accessory that you could add um, I think that would really help for doing real estate photography and moving this around a property so taking a look now at the bloom test uh, doing this with just the standard reflector as it is just uh, right here right now it actually did fairly well let's take a look so here we can see a nice soft bloom that came out of this and this is if you've seen before just a typical bloom test it's just a flash shot to see what does the bloom look like on the ceiling here by trying to block out a lot of ambient lighting when we compare this to the 8200 pro you know i'm not a fan of the bloom but it does work and it's because of that light leak that we get those bars up there but the, uh, when we take a look at the Explorer 600, it's got a huge bloom, and that's because of that 7-inch uh, reflector that's on there. Taking a look back again, though, at the 8400 Pro bloom, very nice concentrated beam, very nice bloom. So uh, I didn't, I'm not expecting to see a lot of color casts off this. In fact, I didn't when I was shooting my house. That's one of the things is that there was more concentrated light where I needed it because of the uh, smaller reflector that comes standard with the 8400 Pro so less light was bouncing around off of the hardwood floors and other stuff to, uh, to cast some of that back onto the walls. So one last thing, and it's a very small detail, but it was the case that this comes with. Now the case is very portable, it's very small, but it is form fitting. So they've actually cut out the foam to fit particular parts of this in there, which doesn't make it very useful for then adding other gear or moving this around. For instance, you have to take the battery off to fit this into the case, which isn't that big of a deal unless you're doing two or three shoots a day and you don't wanna keep uh, taking the battery on and off. As far as the Explore 600, when you take a look at the case 
for that. Typical of uh, Pelican cases I use where I use the dividers, you can use pinch foam, but uh, that also then gives me a lot of flexibility by using those dividers if I wanted to. Now I could see myself, it's a very small thing, I could see myself though since these are lightweight and they are a little bit smaller than the Explorer 600 and I love the reflector on top of this compared to this big old honker that comes with the Explorer 600, I could fit two of these easily with other gear inside of a Pelican case and protect it very well and I just wouldn't really have much of a need for the Godox case that comes with this. But overall, I thought it was a very good light. Is it worth $100 more than having an Explorer 600? For me, the jury's still out on that. If I did a lot of portrait photography more than I do now, that's probably about 20% of what I do. The other 80% is real estate, um, mostly. But I would say that it, for portraits, definitely this would be it because I don't have to worry about a lot of those things of the portability, holding it by hand, worrying about the, uh, the, the light getting dinged by me moving this around handheld throughout a property. So for right now, I'm holding off on using this for real estate photography until I can get a better handle put in place on that and also get it to fit within my gear bags. Because right now I don't really need it. If I have an 8200, and if I've got myself an Explorer 600 and I've got speed lights, I've got the best of both worlds, or all three worlds actually. So I've got everything I could ever need to be portable with a lot of power, having a lot of power, portable with a moderate amount of power, and also portability with the, uh, the uh, 200 and also with speed lights. Now, if I were buying my first mono light and I hadn't really decided on what to do, and if I already had a Godox line or Flashpoint, then I might really think about getting the AD400 Pro. It is a little bit more money, but it is gonna be a little bit more portable, but once again, for real estate photography, a big drawback for me is it's just not ergonomic. So until I can get a better handle put on this guy, get it out in the field, feel comfortable with also that bulb being somewhat unprotected, I'm gonna hold off on that. I have other solutions to fit. But it is a very good light. It did hold up very well. White balance was extremely consistent. Like you saw, the bloom test was fantastic. The power was only slightly less than an Explorer 600. A lot of things were lightweight, like the battery, which also for the testing I did, it lasted very well, better than what I get out of a battery for the 8200. Of course, the Explore 600 battery, I can shoot all, like half a dozen homes easy and that thing still hasn't run out of power. So this has got a fairly good battery as well with it, but overall it is something I'm holding off on, but I don't necessarily say that you should not get it. It is something to definitely consider as a contender for your lights for interior real estate photography. Anyways, I hope this video was useful for you and that you can use some of this in your photography as well. If you did like this video, you can subscribe to my YouTube channel. It won't cost anything. And as soon as one of these videos is posted, you'll be the first to know. Thanks a lot for watching. Until next time, take care, be safe, and get out there and shoot something.